Rev it up and welcome to Cars Yeah, show number 1,492. Imagine you're on your deathbed. What's the thing you'll wish you'd done? This is Cars Yeah, where you'll enjoy interviews with inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Mark Green is here to provide you with a fuel injection of automotive inspiration. So get in, sit down, buckle up, and get ready for a wild ride here on Cars Yeah. Hello, inspiring automotive enthusiasts, and welcome to Cars Yeah. I'm a revved up and so excited today to share with you a very special guest, Peter Grimsdale. He's calling in from across the pond in London, England. Uh, we'll hear from him in just a minute. Peter Grimsdale is a British novelist and award-winning television producer who has made shows for the BBC, PBS, and Discovery. As a lifelong car enthusiast, though, he has made in-depth films about the British and Japanese auto industries, profiling people such as Sterling Moss, Alec Isigonis, and many other automotive heroes. His first book about cars is titled High Performance, When Britain Ruled the Roads, and is published by our friends at Simon & Schuster. Peter has a long association with America, going back to 1974 during his time as high school boy, exchanging students, he was an exchange student rather, I should say, uh, in New Jersey, in Georgetown University, he got his break into broadcasting as an intern for Pacific Radio in Washington, D.C. So he's back on the air with me today. We'll be back in just a minute to talk to Peter, but first, a word from our valued sponsors that make Cars Yeah possible. We'll be right back. Hey, Cars Yeah, I'm a huge fan of Covercraft. I've protected my vehicles with their products for decades. Want to keep your vehicle's interior looking new? It's easy with Covercraft seat covers. They'll protect your seats from the daily abuse of pets, children, weekend adventures, and even those everyday spills. It's a fast, easy, and inexpensive way to keep your vehicle looking new. All Covercraft seat covers are easy-on, easy-off design that are machine washable. You can choose from many fabric options, colors, and accessories, all designed and carefully sewn for your special vehicles. Their seat gloves are semi-custom fit for cars and trucks, and their seat savers, a favorite of mine, are custom-tailored to fit your seats like a glove. Work truck seat covers are tough, durable, denim weight fabric. It's like putting a pair of rugged jeans on your truck's seats. Want to stay warm? Covercraft also offers seat heaters. Covercraft is the right choice. Learn more today at Covercraft.com and tell them Mark at Cars Yeah sent you. That's Covercraft.com. Are you a Cars Yeah subscriber? If you're not, go to CarsYeah.com, click on the free book button, and I'll send you my free filler up book. It's a very cool book I created of fuel filler fun, some very cool imagery, and great quotes from past guests here on Cars Yeah. Plus, you'll get my weekly email follow-up and my weekly blog. Just go to CarsYeah.com, click on the free book button, and I'll send it to you right away. Thanks for subscribing. Well, Peter, cheers and welcome to Cars Yeah. Are you buckled up and ready for a fun ride? I certainly am. I'm very delighted to be here today. Uh, we're going to have some fun for sure. So before we get started here, Peter, would you tell our listeners maybe just a little bit about your life and about yourself? Sure. Well, I'm uh, I'm in my 60s now, um, but I'm still hard at work. I uh, I combine uh, being a television producer with writing books and uh, increasingly writing about cars, as it turns out. No doubt. No doubt. You know, this book that you've put together is really cool. I got kind of a little preview copy and we're going to let our listeners know how they can get their hands on this. There's an audio book version of this, which is a really cool way to do this. Also, tell us a little bit, maybe maybe a little bit, one thing that most people don't know about Peter. <laughs> well, actually, you kind of preempted me there because I was going to say that the, the thing that nobody ever knows about me is that I actually started life in broadcasting in America because I had this incredible piece of luck as working for an intern reporter for Pacifica Radio, which only have a, a handful of stations around the US, but they let me be a reporter for a, pretty much a whole year. And that was the most incredible work experience I ever got. I guess I was there long after my visa had run out. Maybe I shouldn't say that. but uh, <laughs> Nobody seemed to ask me about it. Yeah. Uh, and even though I was reporting on Capitol Hill. 
Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Well, different times for sure. It was. Uh, yeah, absolutely. You know, I find it fascinating. And I guess in a way with what I've been doing the last five years, I'm a bit of a reporter. I uh, bring people's stories to light here. And I'm really delighted to be talking to you today and share this very cool new book, High Performance, When Britain Ruled the Rose. But we're going to start by asking you for a success quote or a mantra, some kind of saying that's been instrumental in forming your life. It's a nice way to get what I call the inspirational tires turning here on cars. Yeah. So Peter, grab the wheel. Well, what I'd say to everybody is imagine you're on your deathbed. What's the thing you'll wish you'd done? Oh, yes. And then go and do it. I'm yeah. sure I'm not the first person to say that to you, but that certainly applies to me. I just thought, God, what if I get to the end of my life? I never read a book about cars because it's been my lifelong interest. I've done lots of other things, fascinating mm-hmm. things. I've had a great life. I just thought, I better get it done. I better yes. get it. And I'm so glad I've got it done. Now, there's a quote, I better get it done. I love yeah. that one too. That that's pretty great. You know, I've I've heard this from many people, of course, and there's always that uh, that meme that's kind of floating around social media. Um, you know, that at the end of your life, people that say, "Boy, I wish I would have." And I had a good friend back uh, when I was younger. We were surfing together one day, and I started to take off on a wave that was kind of a big one for the day. And we were in a place that the waves were what we call kind of heavy, a place called Black's Beach. And I started to paddle and I just went, whoa, and I backed off and I turned around and he was paddling. He said, why didn't you take that? And I said, well, I wish I would have. And he said, yeah, would have, could have, should have, words of a loser. (laughs) And I've never (laughs) forgotten that. Um, Dan Dworsky, I want to thank him for that because you don't want to go through life and at the end of your days say, I wish I would have, wish I should have, wish I could have. I think the other one, of course, connected to that is walk away. Mm. And that applies to a job or a car. You know, if it's horrible, <laughs> don't suffer it. Cut your losses, move on. Walk away. Yeah, that's another great piece of We got two great pieces of advice from Peter today. So I really appreciate that. And that's very cool. Well, let's talk a little bit about what has you excited and fired up right now with this new venture. Again, the book title is High Performance, When Britain Ruled the Roads. Tell our listeners a lot about this book, why you wrote it, what's it all about, and what can they expect to enjoy from reading it. Or listening to the audiobook? Well, one thing that always fascinated me was where the sports car craze in America came from. How come America fell in love with the British sports car? And I really want to try and find out what that was all about. I did a documentary a la- long, long time ago about what happened economically in Britain just after the Second World War. And basically, uh, when I dug into this a bit further, I discovered that In 1945, for the British motor industry, the war was not over because basically the government said, you will export cars, you will export 75% of your output, otherwise you will not get steel because steel was still rationed at that point. I'm talking about an industry that was 95% domestic. You know, we sent a few cars to the empire that we still had, but most companies didn't even make left-hand drive cars. And also, British cars were wholly unsuitable for the key market, the North American market. So basically, in desperation, they threw everything they could at the market in just the hope that something would happen. And a lot of things didn't happen. I mean, for one thing, even small cars, small Austin cars were more expensive than Ford V8s when they had arrived on the other side of the Atlantic. But extraordinary thing happened, which I think we largely have Shell Cavalli to thank for, a young, then young in 1946, ex-Navy flyer who had set up a Jeep dealership in Almeida, California, and he, he wanted to sell bikes alongside the Jeeps. And he heard that there were some cheap imported bikes going from a guy in New Orleans. So he took the Sunset Limited down to New Orleans, and, and he met this British banker called Jocelyn Hambro. And Jocelyn Hambro came from a kind of old British banking family. And he set up a trading post in New Orleans to kind of do their bit for British exports. And Hambro was trying to sell Wedgwood China and sardines and all kinds of things from Britain that none of which worked. And he brought over a, a handful of MGTCs, which, you know, already quite an antiquated design. I mean, they dated back to the early 30s. They, they didn't have any bumpers. They didn't have any indicators. But when Shel Cavalli saw that car, he said he took one look and it was love at first sight. Because what he was looking at was a four-wheeled motorcycle. It was like, hey, this is better than a motorcycle. He saw that. He, when Cavalli saw that car, he'd never even heard the term sports car. 
He the only foreign cars he'd heard of were Mercedes Benz and Rolls Royce. That was it. And so Hambro said, "Well, I'm looking for someone to sell these in California." So Cavalli said, "I'll give it a go." And he he took three back on the train, sold them that weekend. So he ordered fifty more, and by 1950 he was the biggest importer of British cars to America. And you know he started. Now I'm not saying he's the only guy. Lots of people have other stories about about you know, and indeed there were these cars in America before before the Second World War. But the craze it took off. So a year later, it's the first motor show in Britain, 1948. William Lyons of Jaguar needs a show car. He needs something. He's got a new engine, but he hasn't got his new sedan. He needs a show car. So in about six weeks, he designs and builds the Jaguar SK120. They figure they'll make about 200 of them. Puts it on show at the, mo- at the British motor-, motor Show, by which time Americans are coming to the show, and we'll have 200 of them. Well, I'm only making 200. Well, I want 200. <laughs> yeah, he, we'll have 200. By, by, 19, <laughs> by 1951, he's made 13,000 of them. And Man. even that, does not satisfy demand. It's this fantastic untapped market is just discovered almost by accident. I mean, right. nobody nobody did ever did market research would come, yes, I think America is ready for the British sports car. You know, it's just <laughs> like, no, why? You know, and yet there you go. And that was great. But what I then looked into was the fact that, you know, British cars before the Second World War were pretty conventional. British motor industry was very risk averse. I mean, they they didn't like sports cars because they never saw them as something that made any money, which is why the bigger companies stayed away from them. But the other thing is that before the Second World War, Britain only won one or two Grand Prix in the early 1920s. We had no Britain had no profile in Grand Prix level motor racing. I, I mean, I mean cars. I mean, there were one or two. Well, one basically uh, uh, driver, Richard Seaman. But we had no problem. And yet, by the mid 60s. We kind of owned Formula One. You know, Cooper and and Lotus had completely reinvented the Formula One racing car. So how did this happen? So basically, my book is about this extraordinary what I what I see as a kind of incredible renaissance period between 1945 and 1970, which is the mm-hmm. period I look at in high performance, yeah. when British cars just blossomed both on road and track. You know, this is fascinating. And I'll tell you, from a personal standpoint, the TC, when I was, I think, about five, my father bought a 49 TC. And, you know, he was a guy that grew up on a farm in Texas, further away from the concept of owning a British sports car than you could ever be. It was all about trucks and tractors and cows and horses. And he came out west to start his life. And that's where I grew up with my sister and my mom. We were in Southern California. My dad really wanted a sports car, and he found an old MGTC. It was in fairly good shape. Right-hand drive. I'll never forget riding in that (laughs) car with him because the way the doors come down when you're a little boy, you feel big because you can put your arm on the the door, unlike a U.S. car that was giant. And just people would look down and go, why is that little kid in the driver's seat? Where's the steering wheel? But that's the car that started it for me. That inspired my inspiration, that big, tall grill and that beautiful dash. And yeah. And an it, entire yeah. generation of American racing drivers as well. I mean, if you of go course. back to, you know, Carl Shelby and, you know, all the other great guys, it usually started in an MGTC. Yeah, it's amazing. And you'll, you'll laugh or you'll smile at this, I should say, Peter. My first two British cars were race cars, a 1960 Lotus Formula Junior. Oh, and wow. a 1967 Lola T290. And uh, yeah, that's what got me into vintage racing. That's serious. Mm. Yeah, they were fun cars, very different wow. cars to drive. When I had to drive them back to back, I had to get in a whole new mindset for that Lola because that was a fast <laughs> car. Uh, you yeah. know, the Lo- Lotus was kind of small. But when I got in that Lotus, I tried to channel my best uh, Jim Clark brains into that car. Never could drive like him, of course. Well, it's a fascinating story, and, uh, you know, we don't want to give away the whole story, but I think that wet the whistle for a lot of my listeners to get their hands on this book. We'll let you know how to do that in a minute. Let me ask you this, Peter. When did you realize that what you have done in your life for your career was the right thing for you? Oh, I've still been trying to – I've spent my life convincing myself, but, I mean, I've had a a charmed life, to be honest. I mean, I got into the BBC, you know, which is a great company to get into Mm -hmm. uh, when I was 25. And uh, I've been in TV pretty much ever since, uh, and I'm 65 this year. So I've had a pretty, pretty wonderful life. So I, I think I've been doing the right thing for quite a while. But you know, there's 
you know about imposter syndrome, you always kind of think that somebody at someone's going to say, what, what are you, are you, no, 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 come on, you're in the wrong place. Now. Okay, I'm coming, I'll get my coat, you know. And there's always that thing lurking in the background. And I kind of had it all over again when I started writing high performance, because, you know, there are people who've been writing car books, wonderful car books, all their lives. I mean, I've listened to, you know, Carl Ludwigson is a great hero of mine. Yep, he's been and a guest here. AJ Bain, two, two guys who've been guests. Yep. AJ Bain. And AJ wrote, too, yeah. I mean, great writers. So I'm kind of muscling in here and going, oh, you know, but anyway, I've done right. it and it seems yeah. to have gone all right. But, right. No, um, I think it did. Yeah, hey, absolutely went really great. Well, it goes I, back I, to what you said. You just got to start it. You just got to try it. You just got to do, do it. it. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the other thing to say to people is, is also you're never too old to try these ah, things as well. You know, you're not. I always say Colonel Sanders started cooking, selling chicken at 64. So there you go. I well, mean, there's another role model. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. A little roadside stands on Route 66 across Absolutely. America. So yeah. uh, what's the what's the favorite thing? Uh, and I will relate this to your book. What was the favorite part of writing that book? Oh, God. I think it was finding out new stuff, you know, because I thought I knew this story. But, you know, when you really get into it, you go, oh, my God. I, because I, don't, I didn't know a lot about motor racing. I found out an awful lot that I didn't know. Um, and I think one of the highlights, I knew a lot about Jaguar, but I didn't know the story of that Shelby, uh, that Carol Shelby drove for Aston Martin. The year that, I mean, it's such a British story. Aston Martin won the World Sports Car Championship, having decided not to enter it. There's something so British about that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Almost yeah. accidentally won it. You know, so it was a blast finding out n new things and, and work and discovering that it kind of fitted that I had, you know, quite often you, you travel into some subject with a thesis. You think, oh, I know what happened here. Right. <laughs> and then you have to accept, no, 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 you're completely wrong. Actually, it kind of, it kind of worked out what I thought. So that was nice. Yeah. You know, I think it's fascinating. Uh, my wife and I have been watching this, the series, The Crown oh, yes. uh, about Queen Elizabeth. <laughs> and, you know, you watch these shows and they're, they're, you were in the TV industry. I mean, things are done. Are they right? Are they wrong? But what I've been doing, which has been fascinating, and you and I had a little pre-show chat about the importance of continuing to learn throughout your life, is I have my laptop with me. And as they talk about things in that show, I look them up and go, oh, okay, was her sister really kind of a crazy party queen? I mean, should she do all this stuff? And then <laughs> what was her husband doing? And how was he related to this guy? And how did that guy become prime minister? He seems like such a buffoon. And you you learn history as you watch this and, you know, Google things. I, I find it fascinating. I probably miss half the show, but um, it makes it no, a little more intriguing. I think it's a intriguing. great thing to do. I mean, I think the thing is TV is the art of compression, you know. Yes. Um, I've, I've made lots of documentaries and you really have to kind of you know, crush things down. Why it's such a pleasure to write a book is you can just like go off on one yeah. and nobody's there saying, hey, we're going to have to cut this out. And that's the great thing about television. It's, it's a kind of gateway mm -hmm. to more. You know, yes. and actually to be sitting there with your laptop during the show, I think that's a great thing. Well, Why plus not? nowadays you can stop a show, freeze it. You can look something up. And I looked at my wife and said, did you know that that guy Chamberlain actually did this? And oh, my gosh. And that's why he went, oh, OK. And then, you know, I, pretty soon they go, well, you know, she's usually saying, can we get back to the show now? <laughs> uh, you know, I just find it fascinating. Let's take a short break. Thank our sponsors. And we'll be right back. My favorite collector car magazine is Keith Martin's Sports Car Market. I've been a subscriber for decades. Sports Car Market is the Wall Street Journal for the enthusiast and the collector. It's your monthly must-read whether you dream of owning a collector car, have two cars, or 200. Sports Car Market has been around for 31 years, and it's filled with valuable articles, intelligent write-ups, and the latest auction sales. Go to sportscarmarket.com and subscribe today. Plus, you'll get the exclusive SEM guide to restoration shops included for free. At checkout, use the code CARSYA yeah and receive a 50% discount on your digital subscription. It's an exclusive offer from me here at Cars Yeah. I'm Mark Green, and I love Sports Car Market Magazine. Are you looking for a way to get your products or services into the ears of thousands of automotive enthusiasts around the globe? I can help. This is Mark Green here at Cars Yeah. And I'd be honored to be an influencer and ambassador for your brand in a unique and personal way. Five days a week, thousands of subscribers and listeners enjoy the Cars Yeah! podcast and website. Contact me today and I'll show you how at mark at carsyeah.com or connect with me through the Cars Yeah! website at carsyeah.com. 
If you're listening to Cars Yeah, you've probably spent some time working on your favorite ride. But how confident are you working on your finances? You may be able to rebuild a fuel injection system, but can you decipher the details of a mutual fund? If you're like me, investments, insurance, annuities, budgeting, and other financial concepts may seem a bit daunting, but what if I told you there's a book that describes these subjects and more in an easy-to-read and a very humorous way? My friend Chris Kimball, CFP, a longtime sponsor and past guest here on Cars Yeah, has written that book, and it's titled The Saga of Ike and Penny, a couple's humorous journey through the confusing world of finance. It's a fun look at things you need to know, everything from investing to effective ways to get rid of credit card debt, and it's probably the only book on finance with a VMAX on the front cover and a classic Mini Cooper on the back. The book's available at Amazon for just $10, and this book will dramatically improve the direction of your financial future. I gave copies to each of my children. All securities are through Money Concepts Capital Corp. Christopher Kimball Financial Services is not affiliated with Money Concepts Capital Corp. Get your copy, The Saga of Ike and Penny, today. All right, Peter, I want to talk to you about a big challenge or a big failure that you faced along the way. And if you want to relate this to the book, that's fine. Uh, the challenges writing your first, first book have to be kind of daunting in some way. So so walk us through one of these things. But the most important part of the story I want you to share is what was the learning part of this so that you can move forward in a positive way? Well, actually, I mean, it probably comes down to cars. And the first two Porsche 911s I ever owned, which nice. were already qu- quite old and quite cheap when I bought them. Both were dogs. They left me horribly in debt. Oh, and no. uh, by the time I'd gotten through them, I also realized I knew quite a bit about them. So instead of never buying another one, I started <laughs> buying more. And yeah. I bought and sold several with a friend of mine. We did it together. Uh-huh. And I paid off all my debts. And wow. that was just a very satisfying experience to think yeah. that, I mean, everybody was like, oh, you should know why you're buying these cars are crazy. And, uh, and it all worked out horrible. And then to, to actually kind of, kind of make the money back, that was extraordinarily satisfying. <laughs> <laughs> no kidding. No um, kidding. I'm not being smug about it, but it's just one. Well, you know, we've all been there. We, all yeah. of us, I'm sure, oh, yeah. all of your listeners at some point have bought a car. Oh God, I wish I'd never done that. I'm uh, never doing that again. Yep. And and in a way, I said, well, I did walk away from the first two, but I kind of came back for the next lot. <laughs> so exactly. Well, you hit the mark here. I my listeners know this. I love Porsches. I've had many 911s. I still have one in my garage, and um, they're my favorite mark by far. I like pretty much anything that rolls on rubber because I love cars and trucks and bikes. But the Porsche has always been with me since I was a little boy. I'm not quite sure where it all started, but uh, I've just loved those cars. So I'm happy. You know, again, here's here's a reoccurring theme with you today, Peter. You learned from your mistakes. You went forward and found a way out. So I'm really happy you did that. As long as we're on this topic of uh, your fascination with cars, share a story with us that instigated this passion you have. Is there a pivotal moment that you can oh, recall? The, there, there is a pivotal moment, and I can just about remember it. I think I was probably between 18 months and two. Oh, my gosh. When my you father, can remember back to that? Well, <laughs> You've my got father, quite a, quite a brain in your head. My first dinky toy car arriving uh, yeah. in my hands. Uh-huh. Yeah. And that was the moment, really. It's that was it. Do you remember this, what that dinky toy was? I do. It was a it was a Rover seventy five. Oh, a, wow. a Cyclops, as they were known, because of the uh-huh. third headlamp. Yes, um, inspired by Raymond Lowy's uh, Studebakers. Of course, um, it was just like the one my dad had, and and I've had a soft spot for Rover cars ever since. But that that mm-hmm. kind of started it all off. Well, again, you're going to smile at this, Peter. My first matchbox that my father bought me at the hardware store. When I was probably, we were down there in his MG TC, I was probably five years old, was a red XKE coupe, Jaguar, of course. I still have that car sitting right here in front of me on my desk. I still have the box to that car, which is a little crazy, but that tells you No, that's you marvelous. Am. But that's, again, the Jaguar, the MG, it's British. I've, I've got some kind of British blood <laughs> flowing through some part of my brain here, I yeah. think. Yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, yeah, very fun. How about your first really special vehicle? What was that first vehicle? And maybe share a memory with that ride. This may sound smug, but I, I, I'm proud to say I've never really owned an unspecial car. You know, oh, my, cool. my first my first car was a Citroen 2CV, you know, the one like Richard Dreyfus drives in American Graffiti. Yeah. I've never worked out quite why that car was in that show. But anyway, I haven't um, either. 
<laughs> but uh, they are a truly marvelous car. And like all the first cars I had, you know, I didn't spend nearly enough money on it. It was a, it was a very cheap one. And the engine blew. And a friend of mine said, I've got a spare. Come and get it. I was like, well, I come, come on the train. On the train. <laughs> train. So I went, I went all the way over, still 60 miles over to where he was. He said, yeah, you can just pick it up by the manifold. You could. <laughs> yes. So I carried it off the platform onto the train. Onto the train. And, and like it was a piece of luggage and oh my put it back, put it in the car, and it, it worked. It, yeah. was, it was a great moment. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty funny. The first time I went to Retromobile in Paris, and of course, uh, the time we're recording the show, the show just ended over there. Um, I was uh, in the airport in uh, France getting ready to fly back home, and there was a guy behind me, and they were putting baggage. This was back in 2011. They were putting baggage through the uh, x-rays, and his bags went through, and this guy says, what do you have in this bag? And they open it up, and it was a set of carburetors for an old Jaguar oh, that the guy had bought. And he goes, I don't think you can bring these on the airplane. He goes, well, they're fabulous. just carburetors. There's, there's no fuel in them or anything. He said, well, they smell like gasoline. And uh, I don't know if he ever got got through them or not, but I just kind of laughed and thought, oh, well, there's a car guy for you right <laughs> yeah, there. Yeah, absolutely. Now, have, here's a very introspective question for you, Peter. I'm going to get into your head a little bit here. If you woke up tomorrow and you were a vehicle, actually manifested as a vehicle, what would Peter Grimsdale be and why? I mean, I mean delving again into my automotive past, if I was really honest, I, I guess that I had a Volvo Amazon 122S. And I bought it for two hundred and fifty pounds. It was from a friend of mine. A friend of mine said, "I don't don't give me any money. I I'm finished with this car." He'd had the brakes done. He'd done the clutch. He'd done the gearbox, and one day it wouldn't start, and he just like abandoned it for three months. So I said, "No, no, I'll give you a bit of money for this." And um, I gave him the two hundred and fifty. And I I called I called the AA, the Automobile Association, and a guy came out, rescue truck came out. He said. Have you seen the state of these spark plugs? You need a new set of spark plugs. I said, oh, okay, fine. <laughs> I'll, I'll put some in. Put the spark plugs in. That car never missed a beat for two years. My it poor just friend, needed plugs. All that's all, things. huh? Yeah. Just needed a plug. And it, it didn't look too good. I always remember there was always a bit of water it, you know, hanging around in one of, the, one of the headlamps. But this car just refused to die. And I guess I feel in a way I'm a bit, I'm a bit like that car. I'm just kind of slog on regardless. You know? <laughs> I'm a bit like that. A Volvo Amazon. Yeah. You know, this is pretty funny because I just had a great guest on the show, Pierre Hedary. Pierre is a gentleman from Florida. He travels around the U.S. helping people with old Mercedes Benz. And these are people who have like 600s and these really obscure models that are very complicated German machines. And his comment was, always start with the simplest thing. Because our minds tend to, when we have a car problem, tend to go to all these problems it could be. He goes, no, just start with the simplest thing. Is it getting spark or fuel? And in this case, you just needed spark plugs. So so next time you have a trouble getting up in the morning, Peter, you just need some spark plugs. That's all. That's right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. We are entering what I call the, la this is, I'm having so much fun. We're starting what I call the last lap here. I'm going to fire off a series of questions and ask you to give our listeners some very quick blips of that Volvo Amazon throttle. So here we go. Would you share one of your personal habits you believe has contributed to your many successes over the years? I think from an early age, I had uh, amazing retention of automotive detail. Mm. Uh, it was coming very useful. It drove my dad nuts when I was a kid. <laughs> I remember him once saying, I'm going to take you to Venice next year. So you can just stop talking. Well, there are no cars to talk yeah. about. <laughs> well, that's, that's turned out to be pretty useful. Yeah, absolutely. Now, if I could arrange for you to have a drink or a meal, with anyone in the automotive industry, living or deceased, who would that be? Oh, God. Okay, well, William Lyons. I think William Lyons of Jaguar. Yeah. I mean, he's an yeah. extraordinary. Because he was probably Brit Britain's best automotive CEO, but he was also probably Britain's best stylist. I mean, mm, what yeah. other CEO styles their own cars? I mean, yeah, he, styled the side, he styled the Swallow side cars, and he styled the first XJ6. Yeah, you know that that's incredible. So I think he would be a wonderful person. Shell Cavalli, I'd love to have met because yes. I just think he's just such a great guy. And and I guess of of people who are still around, it would probably be Bob Lutz because he huh, he just yeah. doesn't seem to ever say anything boring. <laughs> Absolutely, and he's so forthright. Yes, I think so. And how about the best automotive advice you've ever received? Buy the best. 
Yes. Yeah. Buy the, the best. best you can afford. Yeah. And I didn't listen first time, first <laughs> no, time out. Most of us yeah. don't. Buy the best. <laughs> and if and if you can't afford the best, then you've got to go down a level to the one where you can. Or like my dad used to teach me, wait and save up until you can get what you really want. Don't settle for second best right yes, now. Exactly. Patient. Yeah, it's the same. Yeah. Just yeah. He's exactly right. Yeah. Some yeah, of us yeah. aren't very patient, and I've made mm -hmm. that mistake too. Now, how about a great resource that our listeners would enjoy that you really enjoy? Well, probably they're, they're very familiar to you, but I, I do uh, – the Detroit News has an auto insider uh, newsletter that pops into my mailbox every day. And mm -hmm. I, I really like reading – I, you know, journalism from the heart of Detroit. Still there for sure. Uh, Detroit, despite all the challenges the city's gone through, uh, yeah, that uh, Motor City is still there. Let me ask you this. Now, I always ask my guests about a book. Now, obviously, your mm -hmm. book, High Performance When Britain Ruled the Roads uh, by Peter Grimsdale. What's the best way for people to get their hands on a copy of this? As I know, uh, Simon Schuster's British company. Um, I don't know if they're yeah. distributed. No, it's an American here, company. It's American. A, oh, has, I'm sorry. It's okay. an American company, uh, but I'm published by the British arm of it. Um, ah. If you go on Amazon, if you go on Amazon, uh, you can order it through Amazon. Great. I'll make sure I put a link on Peter's show notes page. Let me ask you this, though. Is there another book you might recommend to people that you've really enjoyed reading? Oh, well, I mean, we've talked about Carl Livingston. Now, there's a book that I particularly like of his, which is called The Battle for the Beetle. The Battle for the Beetle is about how the British military authorities uh, in Germany after the war got Volkswagen going again and against all odds. And it's a wonderful story. I really like books that have a certain amount of social history in them, you know, and that book for me is is a prime example of that. I like to read about cars, but I really like to read about the people and the times and the sort of environment. Uh, so that's one. I'm a huge fan of uh, David Halberstam's The Reckoning about Ford and Nissan, uh, which is a massive tome, incredible research, came out in the, I guess, the late 70s, early 80s. And I think that's a brilliant book. I, the 1922 Boys Book of Motors, which was one of the first books in Britain, at least, that was ever written about cars. And it's by a man called Wilfred Aston. And it's got the most wonderful comment in it. There's a, there's a paragraph called A Peep into the Future. And he says something along the lines of, today in 1922, um, cars are mostly engineering with the people seats sort of fitted along on the top where they can find them. He says, as time goes on, the engineering part of it will get smaller and the area for people will get bigger. And when you think about it, it's the most prophetic thing you could imagine. I, I imagine the young teenage Alec Isigonis who just arrived in Britain, you know, fresh off the boat as a, as a refugee, as a yeah. migrant from refugee from, from Turkey, as was Greece. And <laughs> um, reading that and going, yeah, yeah, I'll keep that in mind because that's exactly what the mini is and everything he did. Right. Um, he's yeah. obviously features very large in my in my book because he's probably Britain's most innovative car designer, engineer ever. Absolutely. And of course, you come up to what we're dealing with today with electric cars, autonomous cars. I mean, the parts, the part number of cars for electric cars is so much less than gasoline powered cars. And that power plant has become smaller and smaller and smaller. And the space has become bigger as we've all become bigger. Uh, you know, so trunks in the front, trunks in the back and uh, trunks in your pants. So uh, yeah, just about everywhere. All right, we're up to the checkered flag here, Peter. And this last question can be a bit of a doozy. If you could only have one collector car in your garage, what would it be? And here are the rules to this game since I'm buying you this car. It's a car you, you can't – oh, you're welcome. It's a car you can't sell. You have to keep it and enjoy it and drive it. Uh, but it's the only one collector car you can have. So you need to be careful how you choose here. Well, it has to be quite a sensible car because I like <laughs> traveling with my family. Okay. So I reckon Bentley Continental S3 Flying Spur. Okay. Oh. That's the four-door Continental. Like the one Keith Richards drove to Morocco. <laughs> I'd have that one. Beautiful, uh, beautiful yeah. car. Yeah, I think so. Now, so that I get you the right one, uh, do you have a color preference? I think a, a kind of very slightly metallic midnight blue. That I don't know why nicely, I was thinking you. blue. You know, I always when I ask people that question, I'm kind of guessing, and I'm usually not right. But for some reason, and I think it's because that car looks beautiful in a metallic blue, of course, uh, very stately, very British. So uh, yeah, I think that sounds cool. Well, Peter, 
You have taken me on an awesome ride today. I knew this would be fun. I want to thank you it's for been calling a pleasure. in. Well, it's been great. Uh, could you offer our listeners maybe one little parting piece of wisdom or guidance before you drive off into the English countryside in that Bentley Continental S3 flying spur? Yeah, I, I could offer you some advice. I, I, I'd say stand up to bullies. Mm. Okay. If you, don't, <laughs> if you don't, it's harder to live with than if yes. you do, even if the consequences aren't in your favor. Yep. You know, I, it's it's interesting you say that. Uh, my father, again, was such a great dad. And uh, there was a kid in grade school who used to kind of bully me. And one day my dad said, you know what, today I want you to step up to him and punch him right in the face. And, and what's really funny mm-hmm. is my dad was never a violent person, never spanked us or any of that back in those mm-hmm. days when parents did that. And I'll tell you what, after school one day, I did that and we became best friends. I think the guy <laughs> finally went, oh, okay. Uh, you're not a pushover. Let's <laughs> let's hang out, and uh, you know it. From there, we were friends all the way through high school. So great advice. Again, what's the best way for our listeners to get their hands on a copy of your new book, High Performance: When Britain Ruled the Roads? Amazon is probably your best your best bet. Um, but just go online, and if you have real trouble, anybody's welcome to contact me. They can find me through Twitter, and I'd be very happy to make contact with any of your listeners. Great. And if they look you up in Twitter, is it just your name? Uh, yeah, Peter Grimsdale. I don't go by any other. <laughs> okay. Yeah, except for maybe uh, your uh, enemies might call you something different, but I have a feeling you don't have any of those. You're such a nice guy. So I'll make sure to put links to all of this so you can get your hands on this book. And I encourage you to to get a copy of this and listen and enjoy it because it's fantastic. Peter, thanks again for being so generous today with your time, your expertise, wonderful stories, and sharing your experiences. And to you and I talk again, my friend. I'll see you down the road. My pleasure. Thanks very much. Hey, Cars Yeah listeners. This is Mark Green. If you love the Cars Yeah podcast, I have something new for you. I've teamed up with Keith Martin, a collector car market expert and the editor of Sports Car Market Magazine to create the Buy, Sell, Hold podcast. Buy, Sell, Hold is the essence of collecting. Together, we take you on an educational ride into the collector car market, talking with industry experts, helping you navigate your collector car journey so you know when to buy, sell, hold. We talk with seasoned experts, who buy, sell, and hold investment vehicles, and they'll share their insider secrets on how they make their buying decisions when it comes to making these important investments. You'll find the Buy, Sell, Hold podcast on the Cars yeah! website, on the Sports Car Market website, and if you're a podcast app subscriber to Cars yeah! Buy, Sell, Hold will come right to your mobile device, just like the Cars yeah! podcast, automatically. Join Keith Martin and me on a great new venture on the Buy, Sell, Hold podcast today. Thank you so much for joining us on today's ride here at Cars Yeah. Drive on over to CarsYeah.com to find show notes and inspiring automotive fun. Download your free copy of Filler Up, a fun book filled with gorgeous photographs of fuel filler fun, including quotes from more inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Download your copy today, and we'll see you next time on Cars Yeah.